Good day, everyone. Hello. Um, on behalf of uh, Feed the Future and the USA Bureau for Food Security, I welcome you to our webinar, Beyond Hype, Digital Trends, Scale, and Evidence. My name is Zachary Bakke, Senior Knowledge Management Advisor with the Bureau for Food Security and today's webinar host. Uh, I will facilitate today's webinar so you'll hear my voice periodically, especially during our question and answer sessions. Um, before we dive into the content, I'd like to go over a few items uh, to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourself, ask questions, and share resources. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll pause after each speaker or so um, for a few questions. The speakers will also answer some questions in the chat box along the way. Uh, you'll see that the slides are available for download in the box uh, on the left of your screen, as well as some of the resources we'll be talking about today. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the recording, transcript, and additional resources once they are ready. We will also post these resources on agrilinks.org. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the two folks behind the scenes who make this happen, um, Adam Ahmed and Adam Schreckengosh, uh, who make this uh, smooth as silk. Uh, we really appreciate all their efforts um, to make your experience as uh, good as possible so that you are more focused on the content and not on technical issues. So with that, onward to our presentations and discussion on uh, digital trends, scale, and evidence. So let us welcome uh, Carl Worcester, uh, Digital Advisor for the Bureau for Food Security, who will introduce the session and the speakers. Thank, thank you, Zachary. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your day um, to participate in the webinar. Um, we're really excited that, that, you're, that you're here and you're listening. You'll be active, actively participating over the next hour, hour and a half. Um, as Zachary said, my name is Carl Worcester. I'm one of two digital advisors um, with the Bureau for Food Security at USAID. Um, myself and Katie Hauser, who's also on the, on the, on the call, on the webinar, uh, make up our, our small but, but mighty digital team. Um, working with, with USAID in many countries over the past 12 years, I've had a chance to see really the development and uses of digital tools and technologies grow incredibly. Um, and to the point now where digital tools have really changed each of our lives um, in, in so many different ways, in our personal lives, but also in our work around agriculture, around food security, around resilience, um, around water and sanitation, whatever we might be working on. And it's going to continue to do so as we, as we go forward. So today, Katie and I are really excited that we could assemble such an exciting group of experts to take us really on a tour de force of digital agriculture, you know, looking at current and future trends, um, you know, exciting and innovative applications, and finally, the evidence of impact. Um, so real briefly, we have the four speakers we have today, um, I think, will give us, will give us this really great um, look at these different areas. So first we're going to have um, Ben Adon, and Ben is, is the team leader for IPTs with, the, the, with CTA, also known as the Technical Center for Agriculture and Rural Cooperation. And Ben's going to talk about current and future trends in the sector as highlighted in this wonderful report that they recently put out, the digitalization of agri African agriculture. Second, we'll have Sarah McKay. And Sarah it leads on managing strategic partnerships for WeFarm, and WeFarm is a really interesting and innovative um, company that's really the world's largest digital network for small-scale farmers. And Sarah's going to show us how WeFarm is bringing smallholder farmers together in East Africa, and also discuss some exciting new growth that they're talk looking at in geographies, but also kind of in their technical areas in their marketplace. Third, we have Jaheel Oliver. He's the founder and CEO of Hello Tractor. And Hello Tractor is probably a company that many of you have, have heard about. Um, it's an ag tech company that connects tractor owners with smallholder farmers in need of tractor services. And Jaheel will, will kind of talk about Hello Tractor, but then also discuss what I think are some of the most exciting things that they do as far as partnerships and really how, to, how they're leveraging some incredible work done by, by external partners um, to make a really huge impact in the countries they're working in. Next, we'll have Brian King, who leads the platform on digital uh, big data in agriculture, a global program for the CGIAR consortium. 
centered on digital transformation and food systems worldwide. Um, Brian's going to focus on looking at that evidence for impacts that digital tools have and and will continue to have going forward because that's a huge gap that we have right now, but it's, it's something that Brian and his team are, are helping us, us fill. So hopefully today we'll, we'll show you that digital is truly at a time where we are m moving beyond the hype and into the practical applications that we can talk about more today. So I'm looking forward to an exciting webinar, and I'd like to hand it over to, uh, to Ben for the first presentation. Good, good day to everybody all over the, the globe. Can you hear me? Hi, yes, we can. You sound great. Uh, go ahead whenever you're okay. ready. Thanks, Ben. Sure. So this is Ben Adam. No more introduction. I'll go ahead. Uh, so I, I don't know if we can put the question ahead, but I have a question for you about the report I'm going to talk about. But before I jump onto the report, I want to talk about a simple framework that you can see on the screen right now. That if, if you are a donor, you are a foundation, you are interested in agricultural development, it should be good for you to have a good idea about this, this framework. So the framework has four components. The first one has to do with digital agricultural solutions. And that is what you are going to hear from Sarah, you're going to hear from Hill, and what we need to do about that is identify the solutions and then promote them. But this is what we have been doing all these years within the sector. The second component has to do with big data and analytics, and this is where the content behind these digital solutions come from. And increasingly, we have learned that you need to have real-time data and I, I'm sure Brian will be talking about big data and analytics to be able to support these digital solutions. So all the solutions that we know of that report, you know, they all depend on this data or content. But the biggest challenge within the sector for those of us who have been working is, is the business case. Most of the solutions that we have are donor funded and they don't have strong business model and because of that, we, we find problem of sustainability. So you need to consider the business case of these solutions. And then the final one has to do with the enabling environment. So all other things, strategies, policies, infrastructure, non-digital enablers as well, and then knowledge part. So if you are designing an agricultural development initiative and you are thinking of the role of information, you need to start considering, you know, this framework, how to take all this into consideration. Now let me jump onto the report. So the report, I will go quickly. I'll talk about the current state. If you, if you can see from this slide, it tells you the growth of digital agricultural solutions over the years, and between 2012 and 2018 in Africa. So this report is about Africa. So you can see the growth within the period. And the detail of this is in the report. So I'm not going to explain. And if you go to AgriLink website, you see the, the link to the report as well and video about the report. Then another contribution that we made in this report is try to classify these digital solutions into what we refer to as use cases. So we have five use cases you know, those who are providing advisory services, market linkage, financial assets, supply chain management, and the rest. Then one key finding, you know, that the report talks about is bundling. So all the solutions are not just providing a service. We have seen that increasingly, you know, these solutions are bundling, bringing two, three, four services together. So. You can see the distribution in this slide. Then we also talk about the registration of these solutions. 
So this slide tells you about how about over 33 million smallholder farmers in Africa are registered by these solutions, from advisory services to supply chain management. So you can see that the biggest portion falls within advisory services. We also look at geographic distribution of this registration within the African continent. And this slide tells you, especially if you can see the West and the East, that there are so many solutions in West, but the registration is very low. You know, over 162 operating, but only 4.3 million registered users. But if you go to East, you see about 146, you know, solutions with over 21 million. So you see a divide of this. We also look at the solution types. An interesting you know, feature here is the blue portion where you see a lot of commercial enterprises, but if you look at the percentage of registration, it's basically about half of that. So the big you know, MNOs and government deployments are doing registration more than the commercial ones. So it's something for us to think about. Another thing to look at is the, the funding for the sector. We have seen that the sector has been dominated by donor funding over the years. And we, we, even though we, we are seeing private sector you know, investment, this has been a good foundation from the donors and other uh, foundations. But we need to go beyond that. So these are some of the top funders that we, we came up with. But very difficult to get funding specifically for D for Ag, digitalization for agriculture. Most of the funding are for agriculture and then a small component of information or ICTs. Impact. So evidence and impact beyond, you know, hype. That's what the webinar is about. It's difficult. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Brian will be talking about it more, but it's difficult to find impact. But with this report, we, we have found some data that shows that, you know, DFOGA Ag is impacting smallholder agriculture, productivity, income. And then when these solutions are bundled, we see greater impact. That is, that is one of the key findings of the report. We also look at the potential impact of this sector on job creation. And, and then, so we look at three levels. We see increasingly we are seeing, you know, IT level jobs being created within the agricultural sector. We see digitally enabled field agents, you know, working with smartphones and others on the field. And we are also seeing the digital or digitalization influencing the agricultural value chain from smallholder to commercial, you know, uh, sector. Some trends. I, I wrote a, a blog on AgriLink portal. Ahead of this, you can read it and get some of the trends in the report if you don't want to read the 240-page report. But this, this slide will, is a bit complex, but gives you a projection of registration of farmers as we see that is likely going to hit about 200 million smallholder farmers by 2030 in Africa. And, but the challenge is not registration. The challenge is the actual use of the solutions. And that's what we need to start thinking about. Because all these numbers of users registered does not mean that they are actually using the services. We also found that, it, as I mentioned about, you know, bundling, super platforms are those that are not just bucket lists of services, but they, they pull, you know, the pull services together that pull upon each other to be able to provide an ecosystem approach of services to, to the whole agricultural sector. So it's not just, you know, a platform that brings market information, advisory services together, but this the services complement each other to be able to reach the whole ecosystem. We also saw that advanced technologies are coming in behind all these solutions, and these are some of the technologies that you know the solution providers said they, they, they are going to integrate into their solutions. 
We have seven recommendations, but I don't have time to go through all the seven. I would like to focus on two of them as my time is running out. The first one is the, the, to invest in the missing middle. So we have realized that there's so much duplication in pharma registration. So there's a need for a kind of middleware, a middle infrastructure to be developed, a data infrastructure with pharma ID, or weather data, and then all other service providers can build upon that. So there's a need for you know, government coordination or donors to coordinate this and build that kind of infrastructure at national level across. And then if you are a service provider, financial service provider and others, you can build on this infrastructure. The other recommendation is about knowledge. Again, with the duplication of all that we are doing, my timer, with the duplication of all, you know, services and registration, there's a need for, you know, a knowledge agenda, investment in knowledge that will inform all stakeholders within the sector you know, to avoid, you know, everybody developing a, a report, database, and others. I would like to acknowledge all those who, you know, contributed to the report. As you can see from this slide, we, we had advisory council from all these high-level institutions, and then together with Dalbeck. Again, the report is 240 pages with a sensitive summary, can be reached, it can be downloaded on AgriLink website. Thank you. Should I just start presenting? Is that do I go or are we waiting for some questions? Uh, yes, yeah, Sarah, you are up. Go ahead and uh, start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Hello everybody, um, thank you for having me to, here today. This is my first ever webinar, so um, I'm a little bit nervous, please bear with me. Um, my name is Sarah Mackay, I work for a, a social enterprise called WeFarm. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about WeFarm, because I would imagine not everybody has heard of WeFarm um, before. Uh, so I, um, I always like to start with uh, this picture um, when I begin my presentation. Which, this is a small scale farm in, um, in rural Kenya. So WeFarm um, is a social enterprise which exists to connect small scale farmers together. Um, and the reason for that is very clear in this picture. If you're a small scale farmer um, living in, in, a, in a farm like this, it's very likely that you're not going to be uh, very easily connected to the world's digital economy. Um, even if you do have a, an internet enabled feature phone, um, the, the cost of data is very high. And so if you want to access information, you want to access um, products and services or a market for your produce, um, you don't have um, a very easy way to have a, a vast amount of choice and easy access to those resources and people that we all, in, um, when we're sitting uh, typing away on the internet, uh, can tend to take for granted. So that was a, a challenge that our founder and CEO, Kenny Ewan, um, uh, identified a few years ago now. Um, and as a result, he uh, set up uh, WeFarm. WeFarm is a digital network that connects small scale farmers to the information, products and services and markets that they need, all by SMS. And the reason for that is, um, is that although most farmers don't have access to the internet, they do have access to um, a basic mobile phone, just like the one you can see in this picture. This is in fact um, a real um, uh, phone that one of our farmers uh, is actually using. Uh, note the fact that you can't see um, any of the keys, um, but this farmer is still able to use WeFarm. So um, as I said, we, we began um, our days in 2015. Uh, we started off uh, our, our service in Kenya. We now have uh, nearly 2 million users. Um, that is over Kenya, Uganda, and, we, and also in Tanzania. The vast majority of our users are in Kenya and Uganda still, as we only recently um, launched in Tanzania. Uh, it now takes about six minutes um, for a farmer to get an answer to um, their question about anything on their farm. I'll go into a little bit more detail about how that works in a second. Um, and our farmers have shared over 350 4 million messages uh, since we started. 
And farmers aren't just um, signing up to we farm and they're not using us. In fact, um, uh, we are, our monthly active contributors of we farm are uh, higher than Twitter, 17% in comparison to Twitter's 11%. So how does WeFarm work? So um, it's, when it comes to accessing information, um, a farmer will um, text a question to WeFarm for absolutely for free. Um, and then we have machine learning algorithms at the center of um, uh, our platform, which analyze absolutely everything about that message, the content, the language, the location of that farmer. And then our machine learning algorithms identify the farmer in our, uh, or the, the, the set of farmers, the group of farmers, in our network who are best placed to answer that question. The question usually gets sent to between 10 to 12 farmers, but if it's a very complex question or a very rare question, it may get sent to more than that. And um, that, 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 that the farmer will then receive a, an, a two to three answers straight back to their mobile phone to that question. Um, and at the moment, uh, as you can see, we are managing to share information at a huge scale. Um, there are over 40,000 questions and answers going through our um, system every single day. And that's in five different languages, and that is including local languages. So two local languages in Uganda, Swahili um, and English are included in those. And it takes about, um, uh, it, uh, farmers receive an answer to their question within about 78% 78% of the questions are answered within one hour. And that is on a whole range of different topics. Absolutely anything from pests and diseases to climate to markets. Um, and, and really um, empowering farmers to seek the information that they need to both um, uh, resolve the challenges that they're facing and also to uh, improve their productivity. And one of the things that we see um, day in, day out, um, over and over again, is farmers asking for um, access to products and services. So they ask questions like, um, where can I buy the best fertilizer for my farm? Um, how can I source a solar irrigation system? And as a result of that, um, what, what we farm would like to do next is not only connect farmers to, um, to information, but also connect farmers to um, products and services through WeFarm. So in January this year, we started to pilot the WeFarm Marketplace. So the WeFarm Marketplace is a digital voucher system which enables farmers to access products and services at a discount through their, through their mobile phone by SMS. Um, the way that works is um, we have a number of different products and services available to farmers. We're able to negotiate uh, on behalf of the collective um, 2 million farmers we have on our system to negotiate a, a good price for those products and services. And the farmer will hear about their availability in a number of different ways. That is through the radio, um, through our kind of boots on the ground, um, um, uh, and uh, through, um, through, through SMS. And if a farmer would like to buy that product or service, they simply send a uh, voucher to uh, a voucher code to WeFarm, and they receive a digital voucher straight back to their mobile phone. At the moment, we're focusing on connecting farmers with um, agricultural inputs. So that's everything from seeds to fertilizers um, to, uh, to, to uh, anything you can imagine that a farmer might need um, to improve their productivity. We're also branching into being able to connect farmers with non-agricultural products. So we've started piloting with um, providing access to cooking stoves and also solar, um, uh, solar products. And um, ultimately, we would like to be able to use the same system that we're using to connect farmers uh, with a market for their produce um, at, at the other end. We would also like to be able to connect farmers with um, financial services, so with loans and also with insurance. So that um, a farmer can access absolutely everything they need to, um, to improve their own productivity um, using the technology they have in their hands right now. And so, um, the, as I mentioned, we've started piloting the marketplace in January this year. Um, it's going very well. We're piloting in two small regions in Kenya and a, a, a larger region in Uganda. Um, we have already um, uh, sold over $1.5 million uh, worth of, of products and services through the marketplace. Um, to show the kind of scale of that increase, 
the the um, the growth curve here on this this slide is actually the real growth curve. Um, in January, there was one point five thousand um, dollars of, of sales going through the, the marketplace, and last month there was nearly five hundred thousand um, dollars of sales going through the marketplace. And farmers, um, similarly to, uh, to the way I mentioned that farmers aren't just registering and, and using refund once for information, farmers are also coming back time and time again to, to buy uh, their products and services through refund. So 54% of our customers have come back to buy uh, twice, and uh, nearly um, one in four farmers are coming back to um, buy four times. Um, this is a great photo of um, an activation that was taking place at a, at a retailer um, who had just come on board to our marketplace. Um, as you can see, this is the, the amount of demand that we were able to drive to, to this retailer. Um, he would never had quite so much footfall um, in, in, in his, his life as, as uh, the day that we, we he became an activated onto the WeFarm marketplace. We've had all sorts of stories from other retailers being able to invest in new premises, um, doubling the number of um, fertilizer bags that they sell. Um, and um, uh, so we, we, we see there's an enormous amount of benefit also um, for the retailers involved in the, the WeFarm marketplace as well. And, and finally, so the, the plans, um, for our plans for next year are to really, really um, inc increase the, the number of farmers who are able to access our marketplace in Kenya and Uganda. We're looking to also um, launch our marketplace in, into Tanzania, where it's not, a, it's not already available just yet. Um, and at the same time, we're looking to launch and scale wheat farms to new areas across the world. So that includes um, uh, uh, countries across Africa, but also um, over into Asia um, to try and um, to, uh, launch a wee farm into a new uh, continent. Um, and we are really excited to move into 2020 to see um, how much more of an impact we can have um, together by working with small scale farmers and all of the um, resources and people being brought together to improve their prosperity. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. Um, now we're going to do a Q&A. If you have questions, please type them into the chat box. We have um, one question from uh, Nick we Weaver. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, hi, Sarah. Uh, have you done any research into the impact that access to the WeFarm marketplace has had on smallholder purchasing patterns? i.e. are people buying more because they're connected? An additional piece to that question is, or are people buying through you instead of other more traditional channels because it's more convenient, easier, but not necessarily more? Uh, great questions. Okay. Um, so in terms of um, impact measurement um, on, on the marketplace, we, we're still quite early days, as, as, as I mentioned, and we're only in uh, two very small regions. We haven't done any specific impact management, but we, we, we have been gathering um, feedback from a lot of our users to make sure that we continue to improve the, the service for our users. Um, and we do plan to do um, a, 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 a lot more detailed um, uh, uh, impact measurement in, into those into that area. Particularly, I, what I would like to look at is um, creating a specific bundle of inputs um, that are particularly beneficial for farmers, and analysing the number of farmers which are now accessing that bundle of um, inputs to to kind of demonstrate the impact that has had on their productivity. And in terms of the second question, just remind me what was the second question. The second part of the question was, uh, hold on, or are people buying through you instead of other more traditional channels because it's more convenient, easier, but not necessarily buying more? That's, that's a good question. Yeah, I think that would be an assumption that we would make is that people, so a lot of the time farmers are buying through us in particular because they're getting a better price for the product or, or service that they're looking to buy. But also what, what we're trying to achieve is um, delivering um, greater choice for farmers, so enabling farmers to have access to um, a, a, a breadth and a depth of products 
rather than just having to be able to only buy the, the one product that they, they, they always buy and that um, so that we're able to, to yeah to deliver that improved choice and, and improved um, also improved quality to our farmers. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, for the next question, we've got uh, Ann Swindale. Um, Sarah, have you done any analysis of the accuracy of the answers to questions? Uh, yes, so the, the, the analysis that we, we do is we, we ask our farmers um, to, to rate the, the quality of the questions that they receive. Um, so that, that uh, take it, taken into account in our machine learning algorithm. So a little bit like um, we are all very used to the rating systems that we all have um, online at the moment. Um, in when we, when we use the internet, we use the same kind of um, uh, process with with our farmers. So we we ask farmers if they found the information useful, and they let us know yes or no. And that um, that information would then um, make sure that that farmer who's um, provided a, a useful question will be more likely to receive a question in the future. So that, that that way we're able to kind of peer rate the quality of the questions um, that are in our that are in our system. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, another question from Kathy Fury. Uh, could you describe your methods for updating the topics, pests and disease, climate, markets, etc., please? I'm not sure if I understand that question. But process for updating the topic. Um, okay. Um, yeah. So, Kathy, if you could provide clarification in the chat box, that would be great. I'll go to the next question um, from Roshan Hana. Uh, how do you identify the farmers that answer the questions? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good question. So there's a lo lots of different parameters are taken into account by the machine learning algorithm. So, um, in so, so one of the one of the one of the important things is the time of day that farmers tend to answer the questions, so that we can make sure we send questions to farmers when they're likely to respond. So we make sure that we get a good answer in time. Um, another of the parameters I've just mentioned as well is um, farmers um, are rated by their peers um, on the quality of the answers that they provide. So um, the, the, the farmers who are more highly rated by their peers will receive um, more questions um, um, by the system. Um, also, we have a lot of other circumstantial um, information about farmers that um, so, for example, the types of crops that they farm, or their location, or their language. So, uh, that, that again, the, the, depending on what the question is, we'll make sure that that question is, is kind of um, uh, directed to a person who is best equipped to answer that question. So that, that perhaps they, they farm that type of crop that the question is about. Um, they, they, they're also important that they speak the language that that farmer is asking the question in. Um, and, um, and yes, so all of those different parameters are all taken into account by our machine learning um, and to, to make sure that farmers get the very best quality answer that they can um, as, as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, just to let folks know, uh, if you have questions for our sp first speaker, Ben, um, you can ask those as well. Please let me know in the chat box if your question is directed towards uh, Sarah or Ben. Um, a next question is, uh, what is the business model for the peer-to-peer -peer advisory services that we farm provide? That's also a very good question. Sorry, I, I should have mentioned that in my presentation actually. So, um, the, the business model for the so the information service for we farm is always free. So, it's always free for farmers to use. Um, but the the way that we are a financially sustainable company is um, through, as we start to introduce the marketplace. The way we farm um, uh, generates income is when a product or service is sold to a farmer. Um, we farm receives um, a commission from the company who sells that that product. Um, to uh, so, so, that, that, so that's how that we are um, starting to generate revenue. It's going to be one of the first revenue generating streams that we are kind of putting in place, um, looking to add in new gen revenue, uh, revenue generating streams in the future. Um, but at the moment, our funding, the, the way we exist, um, is through venture capitalist funding and also through grant funding um, as we get our revenue stream and our um, financial um, model um, working in, and fully off the ground. 
Thank you. Um, for the next question from Lucy Swain, it's, are there any, in part A is, are there any incentives to farmers for answering questions, and B, are SMS free to send? Yeah, great. So, great question. So, yeah, for, um, so SMS is always free for farmers. It's free for farmers to ask questions, free for farmers to answer questions. Um, so, um, and in terms of incentives for farmers to answer questions, no, there's no specific incentive. We do use gamification. Um, so, we have what we call the Champion Farmer Initiative. So, this runs um, once a month. And um, farmers who are our top um, ranking farmers, who they, so they answer the most questions with the best feedback, they select, um, we select one or two every month as our champion farmer, and they will receive um, a prize, which is usually in the form of a bundle of um, farm inputs, um, and often we invite them to come and speak on um, a radio um, slot. So, um, so yes, yeah, so we so uh, when, when we talk to our farmers, a lot of them tell us that they actually really enjoy answering questions on We Farm. Um, they very rarely get asked for their um, uh, expertise and knowledge. So um, many have told us they find it actually very addictive. Uh, we've had some farmers who've answered um, thousands and thousands of questions in the, the period of time they've been using We Farm. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is from Job uh, Cheriut. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, from Kenya, do you ha do you in any way promote market li market linkages for these farmers? And is We Farm helping in job creation in Kenya? So good question. So market linkages, yeah, absolutely. That's in our roadmap. We would absolutely like to be able to enable farmers to sell their produce through We Farm. So at the moment, the system that we're developing is more on the kind of input side, so being able to buy. But we're hoping in the next uh, 12 months to be able to flip that round and use some of the the technology and the the networks that we have in place to enable farmers to start to sell through We Farm. Um, and, and yeah, definitely, we know that that's one of the biggest um, challenges facing our farmers, and so um, something that we're, we're really um, committed to doing um, as, as, soon as, we, as soon as we can. Excellent. Um, another question from Anna Brennis is, in an earlier question regarding how you identify farmers, you answered that a machine learning algorithm was being used in part to do this. Is this algorithm based on call data records, geolocation? Are there challenges with this based on national government privacy laws? Okay, so uh, that's a good question. So it, it's based on, uh, we, we, we gather the data um, that our farmers, about farmers on our database, but obviously um, that is all um, protected by the GDPR um, privacy laws. Um, so obviously we make sure that we're very careful with, with, with how we look after that data. So absolutely, yeah, that is in line with, with all of the national government privacy laws um, because we are a UK um, company, so we're governed by some very, very stringent um, GDPR laws. Um, so, so yeah, that, and that's that question, absolutely, 100%. That are the data of our farmers is absolutely very, very important to us, and we, we make sure that we safeguard that very, very carefully. Okay, we'll have time for one more question. Uh, question and then we'll move on to the next speaker. And so this uh, last question is from uh, Thaven Nadu. Uh, are you able to monitor productivity changes that farmers achieve from the provision of your services? Uh, yeah, that's a really great question. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the way we monitor that at the moment is through um, through surveying our farmers, uh, and we've done a number of surveys with farmers and found that between 70 and 80 percent of um, farmers that we ask. Um, have either been able to increase their productivity or they've been able to increase their, their farming knowledge, which has resulted in an increase in productivity. Um, so, so, yeah, absolutely, it's, we're, we're definitely seeing that having that positive impact on our, on our farmers. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, we'll move on to uh, our next speaker, Jaheel Oliver, Oliver uh, who will be uh, presenting next. And keep uh, providing your questions in the chat box. Uh, we will have a question and answer at the end of this uh, session, and so we'll get back to questions that we missed and uh, um, try to get answers for you. 
Thank you for the, the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Jahil Oliver. I'm the CEO of Hello Tractor. Hello Tractor is an agricultural technology company uh, that connects tractor owners uh, to smallholder farmers in need of tractor services. And these are typically individuals that are willing and able to pay for tractor services, but due to the, the nature of their farming and the size of their plots, uh, they can't afford to own their own equipment. And so we, we get them connected to our marketplace of equipment. Uh, did the, is, is the slide moving? Can you all see the slides advance? Okay, uh, Jahil, it's the um, main presentation pod one. Okay, so so you okay so, um, I think I figured it out. I run a technology company, by the way. <laughs> so um, the mission of our company is to you know fundamentally we want to improve farmers' lives um, with our agricultural services platform. And um, while that may sound simple, uh, there are some some intricacies there. Uh, uh, first off, the farmers that we service are smallholder. And uh, many of these farmers plant manually uh, because they don't have access to equipment. And this manual labor is significantly more expensive uh, than, than mechanization. It's also slower, which means uh, they oftentimes plant late and under cultivate their land. And this all leads to reduced yields. Um, for every day that you, you plant late in a rice system, for example, you lose anywhere from a point to a point and, half, a, point and a half in yield. And so what a, what a tractor can do in a few hours, it takes a, a human almost a month. So you can imagine uh, the decrease in yields that result in that. Um, so you have to ask yourself, in such an environment where uh, tractors are, are needed, uh, what is preventing the market from responding to this demand that makes uh, financial and economic sense? Uh, and the answer to that question is most tractor owners are challenged by providing profitable tractor services to this market of smallholder farmers. Um, this is due to the fragmented nature of the market. Uh, smallholder farmers, in addition to having small plots, are typically dispersed across large geographic areas, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but also, you know, tractor owners make these massive investments in this equipment, but they're oftentimes not the, the drivers of the machines. They hire drivers, and so oversight and fraud are issues. Uh, tractor drivers will take machinery out and underreport the work that they do and pocket the, the profit for themselves. Um, and then the last piece is poor after-sales support. And because there's a dearth of tractors and um, most dealers operating in the market aren't selling at economies of scale, it's difficult for them to manage their spare parts supply chain and make sure they have enough trained technicians on staff because there's just simply not enough tractors being sold to absorb the cost of building up things like a, a robust spare part supply chain. So Hello Tractor responded to these challenges with the technology solution. And at the center of our solution is data uh, harnessed through IoT technology. We make this data available to the customers within our ecosystem, which include farmers, contractors who are managing their equipment, uh, banks who finance the tractors, and of course dealers who provide the after-sales support. And we make this data available in a series of applications that we've developed in-house. And, and again, it starts with the telematics device, which pulls the data off the tractor and then makes it available in a mobile and web application that our truck contractors can use to manage their equipment, uh, manage bookings coming in from the marketplace, manage their operators, the maintenance needs of that tractor, or their fleet of tractors and the fuel being consumed. Um, and then lastly is the booking application, which is a separate application that can be used either by farmers or more often than not agents that book on behalf of farmers. And the agent plays a really important role. They organize demand in the market. 
and aggregate that demand so the bookings come in at economies of scale. When those bookings come in, our technology uh, pairs those bookings with the nearest tractor that is available with the applicable implement. And the technology also sorts through the bookings to ensure that the bookings are, uh, have, are large enough to be attractive to uh, financially attractive to the tractors on the platform based on the proximity of those tractors to the bookings coming in. And so um, because we're building out this platform and there's so many different gaps in the market, we also work very closely with other technology companies um, to build out additional features, additional capab capabilities to service our market. Uh, most recently, we partnered with IBM to develop a product to better finance tractors using artificial intelligence and predictive capabilities to not only identify good borrowers who, who should receive a loan to buy a tractor um, or increase the size of their tractor fleet, but also once that loan is made, uh, the technology helps the, the banking institution or, or, or non-banking institution to understand the risk and the probability of default. We also work with companies like John Deere on the equipment side who help support market development. Um, there's some shared interest there, obviously, but then also companies like Bosch who support on uh, things like predictive maintenance. And so the market is so complicated and so large and the gaps are, are so big, we really do rely heavily, as Carl kind of alluded to earlier, um, on these partnerships to bring these technologies to the marketplace and uh, bring more fluidity to the ecosystem. And you got to excuse the, the, I think the PowerPoint slides got a bit distorted during the upload here. But uh, basically, um, the, the technology and, and the platform and the work that we've been doing um, through our contractors has resulted in uh, farmers being able to increase their yields significantly over 60%. Roughly 60% of our farmers have reported higher yields. Uh, but then there are also other benefits as well to engaging on the platform. And, and also contractors uh, report higher profitability of their tractor fleet and oftentimes increase the size of their fleet um, due to the profits being generated and the ability to secure those profits through the, through the technology. And so we've been, we've been at this for about five years now. Uh, the team has now grown to 22. We're in, we're in 13 countries, um, 11 of which are in Africa. Uh, and then we also recently launched in Asia. Um, we have 24 tractor dealer customers, and I should mention that we sell directly to tractor manufacturers, but we also sell to tractor dealers operating in the market, and then lastly, we sell to the secondary market or aftermarket, which is existing tractors. And then the last customer segment would be banks financing tractors, and we've gotten some great market uptake. We've grown to... Uh, we're approaching now 3,000 tractors on the platform, uh, and it's a huge opportunity. Um, it's a 17 million tractor market, um, which and that 17 million represents just compact and utility tractors, which are sub 100 horsepower technology. Uh, our technology is very well suited for this segment of the market. These are customers that often buy tractors as business assets. Um, and so it's a lot of upside there. Um, the way we see uh, entering into a market and growing a market, we first go into any country and go after existing tractors in the marketplace, getting our technology onto those tractors, improving service delivery to the farmers with that existing inventory. And as farmers crowd into the market, uh, this, this leads to improved profits and more investment into uh, additional tractors to grow the size of these fleets. Um, and then that, that wheel continues to, to turn and we look to continue to increase the number of tractors in any given market and close that mechanization gap. And so this is the team, um, or at least the leadership team. 
with the exception of Martha Highlay, who works for We Farm, and we're really excited about that because um, we see We Farm as a, as a potential partner as they look to build out their platform as well. So with that, um, let me let me pause there uh, and open up the conversation uh, to some Q and A. Thank you, Jahil. Um, uh, appreciate it. Uh, thanks, everyone, for providing questions. We'll uh, start with um, a question from Dick Tinsley. Uh, working with smallholder fields, uh, what is the loss in tractor efficiency, and do you require farmers to group fields to increase efficiency? Absolutely. Um, it's a great question. We, we absolutely uh, require clustering of farmers when bookings come in and there is no tractor nearby. And so our booking algorithm makes that assessment. And if there is no tractor nearby with the applicable implement that is required for that farmer's job, then the, the system prompts that booking to be coupled with other farms until that critical mass is reached, at which point the booking can then be paired to the nearest tractor um, ensuring that service delivery is profitable for the for the tractor owner because you have to keep in mind we're working in this double-sided marketplace and it has to be a win-win on, on both sides and so the technology helps to support that decision making and, 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 and ensure that efficiency in the market um, so I hope that answers the question Okay, thank you. Um, we have a two-part question from uh, Rolf Schinkel. Uh, is this technology also applicable to the very popular Indian and Chinese two-wheeler tractors, one? And then secondly, uh, large parts of Africa growth of labor force goes much faster than economic growth. There doesn't seem to be a labor problem. How would widespread introduction of this technology contribute to the high demand for labor? Yeah, I think um, the only thing I would add to that question, uh, Ralph, is, you know, Africa also, you know, as a region, has one of the highest urbanization rates globally. And so when you think about the labor force available for agriculture, there are shortages in these markets. And as a result of that, many of the farmers under, under cultivate their land, they plant late because they simply don't have the labor necessary to work this land resource that they have access to. So while unemployment rates are high at, say, a country level, when you drill down to the agricultural economy in these rural areas, there, there are labor shortages. And, and of course, tractors can fill that power gap, uh, but of course, systems need to be brought in place as well as uh, fresh capital to finance this equipment. And once the equipment is financed, you want to make sure that the equipment is optimized, and that's our, that's our role. Um, as far as the two-wheel tractors are concerned, uh, we actually look very closely at the South Asia model. We also looked at manufacturers like Dongfang, Sifong, um, who've done very well in mechanizing uh, smallholder agriculture in Asia. And you know what what we learned, and we and we, we certainly have this equipment on our platform. Um, the most common equipment is going to be your 55 to 75 horsepower. But we do have some of these low horsepower um, two-wheel tractors as well. What we learned is these tractors work very well in wet paddy rice systems because they're not as durable. Uh, so you have to be careful about the soil environment in which you deploy this equipment. Also, the density of farmers that you deploy the equipment into. You think about Bangladesh, for instance. If you compare it to Nigeria, where we started, Bangladesh is about nine to ten times more dense. Um, in the rural areas. And so as a two-wheel tractor owner, you have 10 times the customer in your immediate vicinity. And that's important for this category of equipment because they don't travel as well. A two-wheel two tractor, you can't really take on the road long distances like you can a four-wheel tractor. So the density of farmers and the crop system are going to be really important. And we've seen that work well in high dense environments where wet paddy rice is being grown. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question kind right. of covers uh, a couple oh, of no, different no, questions no. that we've had um, from Mary. Pardon? Um, Sorry, go ahead, Zach. From Mary Lucy. Oh, yeah. 
from Mary Lucy, uh, what countries in Africa are you in? Is there a map uh, showing those locations? Uh, should be a should be an updated map on the website, um, but we're currently in Nigeria where we started, in Kenya where we recently opened our second office. Um, we're in Senegal, we're in Ghana, we're in Tanzania, we're in Uganda, we're in uh, uh, Malawi. Okay. Um. Next question, uh, Rosh Hashanah, Hana, uh, what sizes are your tractors? Um, small holders can have very small plots in hard to access locations. This is where the poorest small holders will be. How would you get a tractor there? Yeah, uh, so, so the average tractor on our platform is going to be a four-wheel drive, 75 horsepower tractor with typically land prep implements. Uh, and, you know, as I was mentioning the important role of booking agents, I would say their job is threefold, and these are really important points here. The first role is to identify and cluster demand, so it comes in at economies of scale. That means small farmers can book on the platform, but they organize into groups. So when a tractor drives, you know, 50, 100 kilometers down the road, they have enough demand to justify the journey. The second uh, role is going to be uh, around payments and ensuring that the, the, the payments are secured before the tractor is deployed. Typically what happens is a pay, uh, farmers pay 50% up front with the balance uh, paid upon service completion and the booking agent's job is to make sure that happens. The third one, and this speaks to the question, the second half of the question, is uh, ensuring that the, the, the farmer's plots are accessible for the tractor. Um, because obviously road networks are questionable in some of these rural communities. And so the booking agent's job is to also make sure that uh, the tractor can physically get to the farm. And for delivering this service that's so mission critical to this uh, marketplace, the booking agent is paid a commission that varies from country to country, but averages around 10% of gross bookings completed. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question from Dr. Len Eichler. Uh, do you have a process where a group of farmers in an area can own a tractor and share? Uh, we see that. We see uh, cooperatives using our technology to manage uh, small equipment fleets that are kept within uh, that closed network. We also see large outgrower schemes um, in, in large producers who work with smallholder farmers use the technology to manage equipment within these closed ecosystems. And so it's, it's a mixed bag. I would say the overwhelming majority of our customers would be people who own the equipment as business assets and deliver services primarily. Uh, but of course we do have uh, cooperatives, outgrower schemes also using the technology to manage these assets. Excellent. Um, one last question before we move on to the next speaker. Um, from sort of a follow-up to um, this last question, uh, Godfrey Suleiman uh, is asking, what challenges are you facing while working with farmers' organizations? What challenges? Wow. Um, no shortage of challenges, Godfrey. But I will say um, one of the biggest challenges is there's such pent-up demand for these services, um, oftentimes holding our contractors accountable is, um, I would say, one of the biggest challenges because these contractors can easily be distracted by uh, demand coming from farmers that may be financially more attractive to service. And so the way we respond to that is improving on everything from route optimization to curating demand in such a way where despite it being smallholder farmers being serviced, it's been organized in such a way where you are receiving a net net at the end of the season more money servicing the farmers that we bring versus ones you would find on your own by just parking your tractor in a marketplace and waiting for farmers to come. 
So I would say the reliability of the contractors is going to be a big part of that. We've also instituted some stronger training programs to enforce um, higher quality service delivery and with some new financial products that we're launching to finance tractors, we think we can enforce um, more quality service and reliability amongst the contractors because we now have more control. Okay, thank you, Jaheel. Um, we're now going to move on to our last speaker, speaker Brian, Brian King, um, CGIR, uh, and then we will have a final Q&A after that. So with that, I hand it over to Brian. Thank you, Dr. E. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, my name is Brian King. I, I coordinate a program called the Platform for Big Data in Agriculture for the Global Research Consortium, CGIAR. Uh, we're 15 sensors. We're in about 70 countries. And um, we do research into virtually every aspect uh, of food security from um, uh, genomics and genetic resources through on-farm research, crop improvement, uh, the socioeconomic uh, or climatic context uh, of agriculture and food security. And um, what I want to speak a bit about today is, um, is, is it a, a bit of a kind of higher uh, sense-making uh, level and, um, and sort of how we're going about trying to, to do that. So, you know, those of us who, who, you know, work in this sector, which sounds like everybody who's attending does, um, well, you know, can, can't not notice that there's a, a, dizzying, a dizzying array of, of digital interventions um, in, in agriculture. And that, um, you know, even those of us who, who do it for a living uh, can find it challenging sometimes to keep track of uh, the array of technologies, the array of actors, uh, entry points in uh, food and farming systems, and the actual effects of those digital tools and technologies at all of those different, um, you know, sort of facets that I mentioned. And so, um, well, let me see, how is it advancing here? Is it ah, oh, there we go, yeah. Now, those who work specifically with digital technologies will, will recognize this, um, this graphic from the technology consulting firm Gartner, who every year uh, plot out essentially the kind of irrational exuberance that is kind of a feature of, of, of you know, just the, the IT and tech sector in the sense that a new technology emerges. Uh, there's a lot of really great excitement about the potential of that technology. Uh, some overblown or inflated expectations about the technology. Uh, those hopes are uh, almost inevitably dashed. And at some point, that technology, you know, kind of stabilizes and finds its place um, in the overall sector. Um, it's important to note that, I mean, this is a feature of our sector, and it's something that we need to be very um, intentional about managing. And that also means that for digital agriculture, there's going to be a perennial uh, evidence gap because digital technologies will be going through this, this, this sort of churn. And so what we need to be doing is building the evidence base in a way that is comparable, in a way that we can agree um, at a minimum you know, sort of how do we want to structure it, how do we want to describe things, um, and how do we want to begin to start to extract some lessons that can be of more general use, and, um, and we can sort of be putting evidence into the service of our common goal, which is, um, you know, accelerating um, and securing the benefits uh, of data and digital tools uh, in development agriculture. So this is um, something we set out to do a few years ago when I had the privilege of being part of an uh, initiative at USAID between the Global Development Lab and the Bureau of Food Security called Digital Development for Feed the Future. And one of the things we, we realized, you know, the expanded cross-bureau uh, teams there or inter-bureau team there was that no one that we knew of had really gone through the exercise of running down all of the leads out there, both from business press or uh, things we heard about through our own uh, contact networks, uh, some lit review, 
um, and go and just sort of take a look at the evidence and plot out or map the, those bits of evidence to uh, the and I, you know the traditional kind of uh, agricultural value chain uh, segments. And um, so we went through that exercise. It was 300 and some uh, uh, bits of evidence, and we arrived at about 40 that we felt were pretty credible, uh, and that was a, a, a measurable uh, value add of data or digital tool. Um, um, and contributing and mapping to at least one of the value chain uh, segments. And so, um, you know, we learned a few things about, along the way about um, how do we sort of manage that hype cycle or manage the hype. Um, you know, the, the specific potential benefit, the specific value add that, um, you know, a, a technologist or a project or a startup um, is trying to claim uh, it sometimes you know needs to be a bit better defined um, and certainly for development practitioners you know we we need to be um, uh, looking very specifically at where do we think this digital intervention um, will be better than uh, you know uh, another more mature digital intervention or another existing technology uh, or process out in the target environment um, we heard a lot you know, today about the, these overall ecosystem dimensions of, from, uh, you know, from Ben, from CTA, get some great examples, um, you know, but just recognizing that there are a whole bunch of exogenous factors to the digital intervention that, that are um, important for its success. Um, and um, has anything been quantified uh, already about that intervention? And so, uh, you know, fast forwarding a few years, uh, I'm at uh, CGIAR now, and um, in the last six months, we, uh, you know, took up actually a little bit longer, about eight or nine months now, we sort of took a look back at that effort from D2FTF, from that initiative, and decided that it would be great to try to create a more enduring home uh, for that effort, and um, and to do it in a way where we could uh, engage the, the global network of CGIAR partners, um, uh, uh, put out calls for evidence, and we could start to, start to like capture and collate things in a, in a comparable way. What we decided to do was to frame it much more, a bit, you know, let's see, anyway, we've, we decided to frame it as in terms of the food systems framework rather than uh, traditional ag value chains. And one of the reasons we did that is that, um, Nutrition and consumption are pretty fundamental to the kinds of impacts that we're seeking to have. Those aren't typically captured in the in the traditional value chain approach. Also, the recognition that um, you know the 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 interactions between nutrition, consumption, sustainable production, um, the traditional value chain um, uh, segments, uh, market systems. Um, these interactions are very complex, and that um, increasingly, you know, the the really compelling digital uh, models are linking, you know, two or three uh, across two or three of those different um, aspects. And we've heard a bit about uh, already from the from the other speakers that I, I get a lot of inspiration from, um, you know, about how we can't just be looking at. Um, at value chains and, and certainly not just, you know, one commodity uh, value chains if we want to be building the kind of understanding that we need to build to, to navigate um, uh, things and build intelligence in our sector. And so uh, basically what we did was, um, you know, there's a the, uh, big data platform, a CGI platform for big data evidence clearinghouse, um, and um, you, can, you can poke around there. We try to keep a very low friction process for um, uh, soliciting and, and inputting evidence. And basically, you click on a button there. There's a simple Google form. And um, you can put in some things like uh, who are the uh, intended users, number of active users, location, type, and um, essentially entry point in where in the food system, one or more places in the food system. Uh, and you know what your project will be doing. There's um, another section there specifically about evidence, and um, where we purposely are interested in capturing both interventions that may not yet have evidence, 
or interventions where something is has been measured or is being actively measured. And um, the reason for doing this is that we think that if we can catch enough volume of interventions, that becomes very interesting as well. We could we could know sort of what technology is being used for what, where, um, and we hopefully will be able to start to see some trends um, trends there, and that can sort of help us collectively stay abreast of of, uh, of what's going on. And so yeah, it's it's there. You can there, there about I think the you know you can go and you can filter through. Um, the bits of evidence that are in there are intervention slash evidence that are in there right now, and we have about another hundred or so in the pipeline um, that um, we'll be able to push to it, you know, pretty soon in the next couple of months, I think. Um, and so, what is, you know, just some, you know, what happens, you know, if you go and you fill out a Google form and press a button? Um, well, on one hand. Um, we have a couple of people that are uh, a part of the expanded team here at the Big Data Platform. Uh, Maria Camila Gomez and Jonathan Mokshel uh, are tending to this on the back end. Uh, Jonathan's an ag economist who um, you know, maintains a, a, a good um, eye out for uh, the state of evidence um, for digital and food security and digital and food systems. And, um, so, you know, this team will be looking at lit review and um, kind of helping build things up. So Maria, they'll be the first ones who would be able to see when something comes in. Um, we also have communities of practice, technical communities of practice that are about 5,000 members strong collectively now uh, that are both internal to CGIR and external. And so, um, you know, we, we have the ability to, one, call for evidence from those communities but also reach out to subject matter experts if we feel like something needs to be um, a bit more, um, you know, we need some subject matter expertise to understand if something makes sense. Um, just a note about the standards for evidence. We purposely set the bar a little bit below what you might consider the gold standard. So um, a randomized control trial or an impact study um, would be more in the gold standard uh, realm um, related to evidence. And what, um, what we found is that it's, it's, you know, there's probably a lot of measurement or there should be a lot of measurement going on out there that might otherwise get lost. And so um, what we're looking at is how do we start, you know, capturing more of that measurement. And, you know, as I said, we'll be doing some lit reviews. So those kinds of, you know, RCTs and impact studies um, will eventually get loaded up and put, put into there. Um, so here, let's go. So what will we be doing with this? So we've got, I mean, first of all, just the, the big data platform as a global program uh, is itself um, kind of on offer for um, trying to make the the next steps happen around promising interventions. And so uh, we run a global innovation process called the Inspire Challenge uh, that is specifically about digital and food systems um, in four challenge areas. Uh, we have the communities of practice that I mentioned. Uh, we have our own global partnership networks. And we have a crack uh, communications team that uh, where interesting interventions um, or interesting bits of impact are emerging we really want to be able to communicate about those and, and then help make, um, make connections happen. In addition, we hope that this uh, evidence clearinghouse will equip us to do better meta-analyses and, um, and synthesis reports um, so that we can sort of build some more collective intelligence and accelerate, um, uh, accelerate you know, the, the digitization of the ag development uh, enterprise. Um, just very briefly, when something gets uh, submitted, a very small vignette is generated. Um, we do have, you know, humans in the loop double checking things and so forth, but um, ultimately what happens is just a sort of little vignette about the intervention and, and the evidence um, uh, related to that particular intervention. So I want to close uh, just briefly, um, you know, saying, I mean, it's, I, I know it's, it's, it's probably second nature or it is second nature to uh, M&E, uh, you know, monitoring and evaluation shops and certainly research organizations um, to set up very simple uh, study designs. Uh, so um, if you, but it's also, it's also good to note that a lot of times startups 
aren't necessarily thinking that way. Um, startups are thinking about what they view as their core job, which is capturing customers and building their business, which is completely understandable. And so just to, you know, to underscore that a study design doesn't need to be super uh, onerous. And um, if a digital intervention is, um, so if a digital intervention is about to happen, um, you know, you can uh, think through a few things about that uh, you know, measurable value add or measurable, measurable additionality that you hope that that digital intervention is going to bring. Um, and you can capture a baseline and at some point in the future you can, you can take another measurement. Um, if a digital intervention has already happened, um, you've, you've developed a, a great uh, 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 technology intervention and you've linked a few different aspects of the food system and, and um, are really excited about the business model that you have as a startup, um, and you're, you know, sort of off to market, um, it doesn't mean that you can't study uh, 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 at that point as well. You just need to uh, uh, define those indicators about that measurable value add, uh, 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 take those measures in a community where you, the intervention is happening, and basically go find a control group somewhere that has hopefully uh, equivalent or ideally identical um, uh, characteristics. And, and take those measures there as well. So, um, and then of course, you know, the M&E shops that I mentioned or research organizations like ourselves can of course um, help with setting up study designs. And um, I think that, uh, you know, as a community, we have, um, you know, the, the reach collectively, I'm not just saying CGIR here, I mean collectively, we have the reach, we have the global footprints, and, um, and, I, and I venture to say that if we can use the food systems framework and some very simple ideas of study design, um, uh, we could um, really dramatically increase and expand our understanding about how to tailor digital interventions and uh, we can collectively, um, you know, kind of turn ourselves into a global research infrastructure that, um, that, that really accelerates the changes we're trying to have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Appreciate uh, your presentation. Uh, we've got a couple of questions from the chat box. Um, the first question from Katie Hauser is, are you seeing particular groupings of evidence coming through in your pipeline, i.e. lots of digital financial services examples versus precision ag, or is it a wide variety? Thank you. Yeah, I think the um well, we've got a very, uh, some different channels. So we've got, our, as I mentioned, we have an innovation process that um, uh, we've, we've run through three full cycles now. And so, um, you know, that is essentially we've kind of, those are, those are effectively calls for evidence as well when you put out a, um, a solicitation for folks to go after innovation funds. And so we've got a lot on um, data-driven agronomy, uh, 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 approaches and technologies at least for trying to reveal where food is flowing in food systems. Um, so a, great, a lot of stuff on pests and disease and so, but that's a bit a bit, you know, we've sort of, those are effectively our calls for bits of evidence when we do an innovation process like that. Uh, similarly, the communities of practice that we run are, are um, in different technical domains and so they're, you know, that that is again another window into some different um, types of uh, of, of evidence. And so um, what we need to do is, is um, through investment and, more, and, and put out some wider calls for evidence and um, be able to start to, to um, make it useful for generating some of those trends that you're, that you're implying we should be able to see right now. Um, uh, that said, we have learned a lot you know, through those processes and, and there's a report up um, called uh, Innovation Strategies for Digital Agriculture uh, on um, our uh, publication repository called CG Space um, that I can um, provide a link to that gives a bit of that of that insight. Um, regarding um, particular evidence gaps, um, I thought I think you know there's um, you know the that need to be filled. I think one area that is very exciting. Uh, right now is, um, uh, you know, embodied, you know, by WeFarm and a few others where this digitally intermediated 
farmer to farmer exchange um, approach. Um, you know, it's, it's, it needs to be more fully understood in terms of um, adoption and use of new, of new innovations. I think it's, um, to my mind, it's one of the most exciting things to happen to, to extension work in the last 10 years or so. At this, this um, you know, the way that uh, uh, digital media are creating, enabling creation of, of new types of communities around problems. And, um, and I, I haven't seen, we've been looking around, we've been looking out for, um, uh, uh, for anything really, um, to start to see the the digital value add of that over other things, and there's some that we've been able to source uh, through some of our innovation grants, but um, you know something kind of broader and more systemic um, uh, understanding about that farmer to farmer kind of digitally intermediate intermediated farmer to farmer exchange uh, theme I think is is a big area where we'd like to learn more. Thank you. Um, next question from uh, Rashid uh, Siraj. Uh, where or what is the public sector's comparative advantage in driving digitalization? The, that's a huge question. <laughs> um, so the, there's a couple of things. I mean, one, on one hand, when we take a digital, say we, say we take the uh, digital lens and we look at um, uh, uh, traditional um, extension, uh, ag extension um, approaches. You know, on, on one hand, I think that there's there's huge scope in terms of uh, just building the digital supports that enable then um, uh, digitally enabled uh, advisory. And so, um, you know, public sector that includes public sector universities that includes. Uh, uh, extension agents that includes um, uh, other types of investment and so forth. And so I think you know, in addition to the you know the kind of pretty you know well understood stuff about creating the right enabling environment, I think that help investing in the data assets that will enable um, both public and private uh, um, ag tech uh, actors, uh, advisors, and startups and so forth. Um, uh, to, to to do what they do better, um, you know. So I think a public sector investment in the digitization aspect of it um, would be extremely helpful. Thank you, Brian. Uh, another question from Anna Brennis is: Are you using machine learning to fill data gaps, uh, e.g., voice call data records, uh, disease surveillance of livestock? Et the um, that uh, so with call detail records, um, we've got some research going on um, with um, uh, Dahlberg Data Insights, who hold the you know the use agreements um, with some of the mobile operators and um, to be able to access the call detail records, um, and so we you know we're doing some joint research with them, uh, looking at uh, economic empowerment. Um, as relates to agriculture, and and so that's one place where we're using call detail records plus machine learning enhanced um, areas. Some of our so machine learning enhanced um, uh, approaches um, with regard to uh, pest and disease. Um, some of our specific projects, uh, you know, do use machine learning, and they, um, you know, there's a computer some computer vision stuff for being able to accelerate diagnosis. There's um, uh, machine learning plus nat natural language processing uh, running on um, one of these horizontal farmer to farmer uh, communities um, to be able to both detect and then start predict uh, predicting animal health uh, trends. Um, so there are there are some cases of that, but it's you know really needs to um, to link back into the use case and um, and 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 of course. You know, in each case, you have to be navigating what the responsible data uh, dimensions of that of that um, data use is. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, we'll answer a couple more questions, but just to draw your attention to it, those who are still with us, um, that there, there are our 
ending polls. Um, these polls are helping us to improve on our webinars into the future and find out how you found this webinar. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to um, answer them. Uh, with that, I will go to another question um, from Ian Morell. Is there any work going on going on regarding infrastructure improvements? Is that for? Um, to heal? Is that for, pardon me, Ian, if you can clarify who that question is directed for, um, we'd appreciate it. Uh, I'll go to the next question real quick. Uh, you said Brian. Oh, you said Brian? Okay. Yes, it's to towards you, Brian. Uh, so, yes. Um, I mean, that's a bit um, a bit broader than the, the specifically the evidence clearinghouse effort while we're trying to have enough comparable um, sort of comparable standards on what kind of data are interesting and why we think it's interesting for understanding digital and food systems. Um, I mean, the, the, the program that I lead is itself an effort to improve the overall infrastructure for digitization in, of agriculture in developing economies, the platform for big data in agriculture. And um, we have a, um, there's a, um, a data discovery tool called Guardian, G-A-R-D-I-A-N, that is linked to open data repositories at all of our 15 centers. And so, um, you know, as uh, research is conducted, because uh, we're a, you know, sort of research for development or research for impact organization, uh, the data assets and the publications um, are discoverable by a guardian. And so we've got a few of the pipelines built whereby data that goes into guardian um, can start to go into um, a common analytic approaches, um, uh, you know, the typical uh, crop models um, that have been around for some time, um, you know, making sure that the data uh, meets minimum quality standards to be able to feed into different types of analysis. Um, so, you know, to some degree, well, to a large degree, we are right now a global infrastructure, and um, what we're focusing on is um, continually building the partners that we're engaging with in terms of getting that data discoverable um, and then applied. And so right now data is discoverable, discovered from um, uh, 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 several um, National Agricultural Research Institutes, USAID, uh, DFID, um, and, um, um, and progressively in country-wise we want to be able to use that infrastructure for building this kind of overall data uh, ecosystem. So there's a couple of steps between there and the, um, you know, um, startups being able to use this, say, or ag extensionists being able to use this. But, but um, you know, I think we'll have some pretty good use cases on that pretty soon as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, and thanks, everyone, for participating. Uh, we'd like to start on time and end on time. So with that, um, thanks to all of our presenters uh, for an excellent um, webinar today. Thank you for our audience for the very dynamic uh, discussion, the questions. We greatly appreciate it. And again, taking a moment to fill out our polls. Um, we do take these seriously and again, try to improve upon this webinar experience for you. Uh, as we got feedback from our last webinar, folks really appreciate the ability to do more engagement, have uh, more opportunities for Q&A. And so for this webinar, we worked with the presenters to make sure that there was space uh, after uh, presentations to do more Q&A. And so uh, we really appreciate um, the time you've taken to, to answer questions and um, provide questions. So uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, we hope you have an excellent rest of your day or have an excellent evening uh, sleep. Uh, and we will see you at the next AgriLinks webinar. Thank you, and 